In this video, we'll be looking at the components that went into writing the Hello World program that we wrote in the last video, as well as looking further into the Java data types and the structure of a Java program. So let's start off. I'm going to create a new project, and I showed you how to do this in the last video, so we're just going to fly through this. And I'm going to call it Hello World, but we're going to go into a bit more detail. So here's the Hello World project that we've just created. And in the folder, you can see we have the SRC, which stands for source file. And in the source file is essentially where we write all our Java classes. And so the Java classes is where we put our code. So I'm going to right click it and click new and then Java class. And I'm just going to call it my program. You can call it whatever you want. And so our naming convention is typically to have a capital letter. And then instead of having a space for my program, we're just going to have another capital letter. And so I'm going to hit OK. And then what we're going to do is, well, any Java program that you write is going to have one key thing, and that's a main method. And so I'm going to write that out, and then we'll explain what it actually is. And so that's first we're going to have public. And as you can see, as I'm writing it, IntelliJ sort of has an autocomplete, which makes our life a lot easier. So public static, and as you can see, it's coming up again. And I'm just going to hit enter, void, and then main. Okay, and the main is going to have something called parameters, which is sort of things that it takes in. Okay, and that's going to be in the form of a string array, which I'll go into further detail afterwards. And then args. Okay, and so now all of this is going to be encapsulated in a scope. So what a scope is, is simply defined by these two, well, the curly braces that I have here. And so what that means is anything in these curly braces will apply to the main method. Okay, so if I write something here, It'll have nothing to do with the main method unless I explicitly call it through a function, which we'll look at in the next video. Furthermore, we also have the class here. So as you can see, anything that I write in the in this class will be between these two curly braces. So if I write something here, so this is valid Java code, uh, int number, so it's just saying an integer number is equal to zero, then as you can see, we get these red squiggly lines, and those basically means we have an error. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of that, and then let's look at what I've actually written. So here I've written public. So what that means is that this main method will be visible uh, from any other Java class. So I can write another, I can create another Java class and I'll be able to access it. Furthermore, static means that it's a method that can only be run by the class itself, my program. And then void, that essentially means that you're not going to return anything from uh, this running this program. You may print stuff out, but we won't actually return a variable that will be used by another part of the program. Okay. So now let's start off with the code that we wrote in the last in the last session. So we had system.out.println and you can sort of get an idea of what this means. So essentially it's going to output code as we knew as we already know and it tells the system to output uh, on a new line whatever we select to print. So we can say hello world and what we're doing is we're actually defining a string here in this hello world part between these double quotes. Okay? And so I can run that. So if I hit if I right click here and hit run, then it'll start compiling and I'll get hello world. No surprises here, it's just everything we had in the last video. Another part I haven't spoken about is also this semicolon here. So what that does is essentially marks the end of the line for your Java line or code. And that's really useful because I could say, for example, have a super long piece of code. And if I did, then I would simply be able to hit enter. And it wouldn't matter that this finished here because this would still compile and complete normally. So what we can see here is, for example, this is going over two lines. And if I run this, it should still print hello world as normal at the bottom here. OK. And so we can see that Java actually doesn't look for the new line to see your line of code ending, but it will actually look for this semicolon. So if I if I control Z this or command Z this and go back to normal, and if if I get rid of this, then we'll see an error comes up with a red squiggly line, and this is really useful and that a uh, really useful feature that IntelliJ does. And if I hover over it, then what essentially it will do is what well, we can see I've got a red squiggly line here, and it will say that the semicolon is expected. So I'll put that in. Now let's look at the data types. Here we have hello world defined between two double quotes, which is known as a string in Java. So a string is essentially a collection of letters or numbers. 
all put together to form a sentence like we have here. And the way we define that is simply writing string and then we can give it any name we want. So I'm just going to call it my string and it's going to be equal to or defined by hello world. Okay. And so what I've actually done here is I've actually defined it. Uh, so I've, what, I've what's called declared it. So I've declared a string called my string and then initialized, i.e. set the value to hello world. So I can get rid of this here and I can replace it with my string. And then if I just run this program, I should get hello world printing as normal. And we can see that's changing. So for example, I can add an exclamation mark or two exclamation marks in and hit run. And I'll get hello world exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Now I also mentioned we could use numbers. So let's swap this out for a number. So if I highlight that and change it to say the number 14, then what I can do is if I print that or if I run it, we should get 14 printing out as we do. But what about if we wanted to actually do some sums because we use computers like calculators, right? So say I said we had 14 plus, whoops, 14 plus three. Now, 14 plus 3, you and I both know is 17. So it should output that, shouldn't it? Well, let's see what happens. So I run the program, and it actually prints out 14 plus 3. So we can see here, the string will actually take in the, any, the actual value of anything between the double quotes. So literally, what you give is what you get. And that's where we, we come into the integer operators in Java, or the integer data types. And we could potentially use int or short or byte or double or float. So let's go over each of these one by one. The int is the most common one. So we can say int my number and we can say that's equal to 14. And then what we could actually do is just say int my number two or int, yeah, int my number two and make that equal to three. And notice how I'm still ending everything with a semicolon. So that Java knows it's the end of the line. And then what I can say is int my number three is actually equal to my number two. And notice when I start typing it, it's already saved. So I can hit enter here. So my number plus my number two. And then if I print that out here, we can get my number three. And so if I run that, well, we should get 14 plus three. So let's see if that happens. And we get 17, okay? But int does have its limitations. So one of them being that the actual value of an int, when we think about, well, when we think about programming, we think about data, memory, and we want to be as efficient as, efficient as possible as we can with those. And so an int actually takes up, well, it'll have a range of values between minus 2 to the power of 31 to 2 to the power of 31. And that's because the actual number itself is a 32-bit number. So it takes 32 bits in your memory space, okay? Uh, and so we can use shorter numbers, shorter values, because obviously 2 to 31 is quite a big number. And so what we can actually do is have what's known as a short. And a short is, again, defined in the same way. We just write the name of the data type, so short. And then I'm going to call it my short. And that could be, say, 78. And it would work in the exact same way as an int, except its values are restricted to uh, minus 2 to the power of 15 to 2 to the power of 15, so the positive value. And that's because it itself is a 16-bit number. And then we can do the same thing with a byte. And it's the same thing, but is an 8-bit number. And so it can take any values from minus 2 to the power of 7 to, the po to positive 2 to the power of 7. So that's all well and good. But what if I wanted to, say, use my int, um, So, but I wanted to use a decimal number? So if I put in, say, 3.14, okay? Now, as we can see, we've got the red squiggly line, which means there's an error. So if we hover over, it says, well, it's required an int, but it's found a double. And that's because integer or short or byte data types can't actually take into account uh, decimal points or decimal values. So we have to use a new data type, which is known as a float, okay? And so what a float is, is essentially just lets us store our data types. And it's um, 32 bits, so it's the same size as an int, but 
the number of uh, decimal points is sorry the number of num the number of digits after a decimal point is restricted okay but we can then say well what we could do is just say float decimal equals 3.14 and then ending it with my semicolon and then what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to comment this out and so to comment it out all you have to do is click line click next on the line you want to comment out and hit command and slash or control slash okay and that's the equivalent of just typing in a double slash and so what this does is it comments it out so it's there for us to see but the computer the program when running through will just ignore it okay and so now let's come back onto this line well as we can see we have an error right and that's because every time we define a float we actually have to finish the uh, number with an F and that's so the compiler knows it's reading a float okay and so if we change this to decimal then we can see that if we were to run this we then get our value for the float 3.14 okay and so now let's move on to our next data type which is a double and a double is similar to a float except it can store much larger numbers and so it's actually a 64-bit number okay and so what that means is essentially it can store twice the value of a float so I'm going to call this double decimals okay and that's that's one key thing so if I for example put a value in here um, first of all I don't actually need to put an F in like I did with float but secondly if you notice here if I have the if I have both variables having the same name then I'll get an error and the error is that the variable is already defined okay and that's because in Java you can't define data types with the same name otherwise the program itself doesn't know the difference between them and so I'm gonna keep my names different and ca call this one decimals and it essentially works in the same way it can store decimal numbers which are much longer and speaking of long although int goes to 2 to the power of 31 is its highest however that might not be enough okay and so that lets us introduce a long which is essentially a value a value which goes um, from 2 to the minus 63 to the power of to the positive uh, power of 2 to the power of 63 okay so that's it's quite a long range and again it would be used in the exact same way and I would literally just write my numbers in and use them as normal and now to make any of these numbers negative all we need to do is simply just add a negative or minus sign in front of the number and it'll make it negative so that's regardless of the actual type of the number so if it's a long or a short we do the same thing and now we come on to two more data types which are chars and booleans so a char is like a string except it has only uh, one letter, sorry, one, um, one character that can be stored. So the way we do that is simply, instead of using a double quote, we'd use a single, single quotes, and then we put whatever we want to store inside. And then obviously we end it with our semicolon. And then a boolean is what we use to store a value that could be either true or false. So the way we do that is, again, by stating the type, first of all, and then we give it our name, and then it can either be true or it can either be false okay and as you can see IntelliJ also auto completes that because there's only those two values and now the final data type is known as a byte which is the smallest in terms of all the numbers in the range it can represent which is from minus 2 to the power of 7 to or minus 128 to 2 to the power of 7 minus 1 so 127 and the way we represent that is the same as the last ones and so we can set it from, for example, we can set it as a number, say, 12. But if we try something like 128, you'll notice that we get an error. And that's because it's saying it's found an int, but it's required a byte. And that's because it requires a byte because we've specified a byte here. But it's found an int in terms of the size of the number that we're giving it. And so if we change this to 127, there's no errors. And we can also see the same thing on the other side. So if we have minus 128, like I said, it can go to minus 2 to the power of 7. And so there's no errors here, but if we put in 100 minus 129, we get an error. So when you're thinking about all of these, it's really important to consider the range of the numbers you're going to be using. And often you want to try and use the smallest data type, so a byte or an int, but you want to also make sure that it fits the needs of your program. So that wraps up all the data types. And as you can see here, one last thing to note is all these data types, which are in blue here, they're all actually primitive data types, whilst the string is actually not. 
However, it's still commonly used and probably is just as common as these data types. And so we'll actually get more of an idea of what this means in the later videos. And from now on, we'll be looking through uh, programming with these data types. And so you can see in the next video, for example, we'll be working with functions where we'll be using all of these to try and create our own calculator program. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, share and subscribe.